Hello and welcome back to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Whoa, can anybody else believe that we are almost through August of 2023? <laughs> I don't know what's happened to this year, but it has flown by so fast, and I can't believe that right now I'm actually in the Pantanal, enjoying my first trip to Brazil and seeing the infamous Jaguar. So this month has been super fun. As a quick recap, we went to Tennessee and learned all about the elk restoration project. Then we flew all the way over to Australia to learn about wildlife drones and revolutionizing wildlife tracking. Then we went to Costa Rica and met a phenomenal photographer that is using fine art to raise conservation awareness. And lastly, in this month, we reposted episode 31 in celebration of my trip to Brazil, which was the show's first episode to Brazil to learn about the Lajil's bottlenose dolphin. If you missed any of these episodes and would like to hear a little clip before going back and listening to the whole thing, check out this episode. See if anything piques your interest and then go back and listen to it its entirety. All right, everyone, here we go. First in August, we sat down with Lisa Mueller, PhD, one of the masterminds behind the massive elk restoration project in the Tennessee Appalachian Mountains. I talk about being at the right place at the right time and maybe to help all of us understand this, this theme or, or this reintroduction more, could you maybe go into a little bit of the history of the elk in maybe specifically in the Appalachians, but also maybe on a broader scale. So maybe get, catch us and bring us up to speed on before pre 2000, December, 2000, what had happened to elk, especially in this region up until that point. Yeah, that's a that is an interesting question. And the eastern elk, which is a was a unique subspecies, actually they they um, determined that it went extinct. So the closest relatives are the Rocky Mountain elk subspecies and the Manitoban subspecies. And you know, elk are pretty adaptive. They can live in a wide variety of habitats. So elk were gone in the east and i um, not sure the dates of the rest of the eastern part of the U.S., but in Tennessee, the last elk was, um, I think, reported shot in 1865. So they've been gone from the landscape for a very long time. And, you know, of course, it's difficult in the eastern U.S. to find areas where you can release a very large herbivore and you have enough open spaces that's not going to cause problems for humans. And so, you know, several states have embarked on this restoration of this large charismatic species that used to be here. And Kentucky was by far the, had the largest restoration project and they brought in animals. Like I said, I think they started maybe in 95. And so they brought in animals mostly from the Western United States. So they came ultimately from Yellowstone stock. And about the time that Tennessee was thinking about it, there was the issue of chronic wasting disease out West, but that was not something that any of us thought would ever come in the Eastern US. And so it wasn't real high on the radar, but there, was a herd in um, Alberta, Canada, at um, Elk Island National Park. And so it's a small national park that's east of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. And they had been monitoring the herd for a long time for many different diseases. And so when you think about moving animals, you always have to worry about their biological package. You know, what parasites, what viruses, what what are they carrying with them? Because you don't want to release something that that wasn't here. And so because that herd had been monitored so closely, that's why they chose Elk Island. And um, as opposed to the Western states where Kentucky got their animals. And so Elk Island is kind of interesting because at the time it was actually very beneficial to them as well because it's a high fenced 
National Park that basically has animals on both sides of a major highway and each side separately fenced. And they trap animals on both sides of the highway and then they, they move them to a central holding facility and then there they're able to ship them out to different places. So Elk Island was a stocking source for actually herds in Ontario, herds at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and also in Tennessee. And land between the lakes in western Kentucky, western Tennessee, where they come together, they also received animals from there. And it worked out well for Elk Island because they have, it's a small national park, it's high fence, they have elk, they have moose, they have whitetails, they have bison, and they don't have any natural predators besides coyotes, which aren't very effective on the large hoofstock. So <laughs> they needed a means of controlling the herd. And so it worked out well, and we were able to get animals. And they were basically um, driven from Alberta down to Tennessee without stopping. <laughs> and they were held overnight in a trailer, and then the trailer doors were open, and we had elk in Tennessee. <laughs> Do you remember that day? Were you there? I was. I I remember very vividly because, you know, it was there was a lot going on, right? And so we were going to be responsible for monitoring all the movements. And so these were all the animals before they were released. When they were worked up at Elk Island National Park, we were able to put radio collars on them. And so before shipping, they all had collars and they were all tested for different diseases. And, you know, we tried to make sure it was, everything was as healthy as possible. But once they're released, of course, you have no <laughs> control anymore, you know? So um, we were monitoring their movements and survival. Very interested in how they, well they would do on the new landscape. Next, we met Debbie Saunders, PhD, the amazing woman that has revolutionized wildlife radio telemetry tracking through her company, Wildlife Drones. It's like, and the story has officially launched. Okay, so what's really cool, though, is you actually then went on to figure this idea out. So how? So I guess we're also, too, before you explain how, for context, around what year was this? What year did you have this idea? And then how did you go about actioning? It's like, I've had this idea. What was step number one? How did you start this off? Yeah, well, we, we needed funding to to explore whether it was even possible. So it was just an idea. Um, this was back in 2008 that I had this idea. I was still in the final stages of my PhD. So I did that research um, in the run the recovery program for the species, but then I realized we had all this data and we didn't do anything with it. So I then did my PhD on this species in particular and looking at the conservation of it. Um, and it was in the final stages of that when I'm like, oh, we know so much now, but don't know about the movements. And so I had the idea, but actually convincing other people to give you funding um, to support that idea was a, was a whole different ball game. Everyone who's in research, you know, knows that they, you know, applying for grants is one of the hardest things um, and you have to do it all the time. Uh, so we applied for grants, major grants for about three years before we were successful and we ended up getting um, a non-profit partner on board, um, Loro Park, actually, that enabled us to apply for a specific type of funding that we could then explore this. But at that time, drones weren't common. They weren't everyday tool that people have now. It was really hard to find anyone who actually knew what a drone was and how they work, never alone, um, you know, someone who was just knew so much about that, that they could just, I wanted to focus on the sensor, not on the drone. I just saw the drone as a platform and there was only a couple of organizations that had any knowledge and access to drones at that time. So in 2011, we finally got some funding to, to um, explore whether it was even possible to do this from a drone. And that was a, a three-year project um, that we, I did with the University of Sydney and they had a field robotics center. So they already had a number of drones and they had everything from social robots, aquatic robots, aerial, terrestrial. So yeah, it's a pretty fascinating um, group of people there. And so I was very fortunate to find them. And so um, we just worked with them to develop this system and we proved that it was possible, in fact. Um, and 
So we we set up a a demonstration event to to prove and like you know, show people what was possible. Um, but we had done a lot of testing. We started with tags just on a runway, um, like just at the end of a like tarmac, if you like, to do all the initial development of the antennas and the radio receiver, et cetera. Once we got that functioning, we then went off into a natural environment and did some more testing there, just putting tags around. And and that was all great. And then we're like, okay, well, we need to demonstrate this on on a real animal. And it was really interesting, the difference between a tag sitting on a fence post versus a tag on an animal. So the animal is continuously moving um, and obviously in three-dimensional space and, and the antenna direction is changing all the time. So the data that you get is much noisier than anything from a static tag. And so, yeah, it's just another, it's just a challenge that you have to overcome. Uh, but really good to ground you in in the you know how realistic the technology is in terms of usefulness in the field. So we set up a demonstration project um, right at the end of the project. So we've done a lot of testing. We're like, yep, we proved it worked on a on a common bird species. First, we actually had trouble with attachment for the swift parrot. We we did captive trials for I think two years, and we were unable to find an attachment method that worked because there's the, 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 this species has really tiny little legs and they're really fleshy. So you can't really put anything on their legs and they didn't like a harness, which a lot of birds get a harness on for their tag. They hated the harness. They wouldn't fly if they had a harness put on them. Oh, um, there, no. was also, there was also entanglement issues. So because they fatten up for migration and then they lose weight, the harness will then actually get loose and they clamber around um, vegetation and their nesting hollows are really jagged little um, hollow openings. And so it's very highly likely for entanglement. So there's all these risk factors that just wasn't worth it for a species um, of this, of the status of this one. So we just went for the common bird, but we just got to prove that it works, right? So uh, we did that. And then we did this demonstration project that we were supposed to be the big reveal and the amazing announcement of everything we'd done and it completely failed. So it was, oh, it, no. was, it, was it was like my worst nightmare to be honest. Oh my um, God. And we discovered a new flaw in our system at that point in time, um, even though we were the first in the world to demonstrate this. So we'd, we'd, done, we'd done the work, we'd proven it was possible. But we also identified all of the flaws of, of that technology that we built and how uh, it really wasn't a user-friendly tool. There were many constraints. And what happened was that there was a massive um, radio interference at the site that we chose to do our demonstration at that we weren't aware of. And so every time we launched the drone, as soon as it got 10 metres off the ground, it was just swamped with massive signals. And we didn't, we didn't know where it was coming from. And so, but what, you know, at, at the time it felt pretty terrible, but, but we actually got a lot of media coverage um, for what we had achieved and people from all over the world started contacting me and saying, I really want one of these things. How can I get one? And I'm like, oh, you don't want it. You don't want it. It's like, <laughs> Um, but then the people kept asking, so I, I just started exploring. I knew what the problems were, I guess. So that's what was revealed at this point, um, what all the limitations were. And I knew what had to change in order for it to be something that was of use. So I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm only going to move forward with this if I can address each of these problems. And so then I just had to find, I had to find a whole new team because we now had no more funding again. <laughs> um, and so I had to find people who were willing to work for free for a while, and, and I found a, a professor of RF engineering who was willing to come on board, which was amazing. I found another science communication student who um, was also willing to come on and just get experience in, in doing the marketing side of things. And I went off to like innovation um, school, if you like, and, and learned how, about how to translate a prototype into a product, how to validate the market and, you know, and had to build up a team, had to get back to, we, we developed a whole entirely different system after that. And so we owned all of our own IP, which was really great. And we were able to sort of move forward in that way. But there was a number of years where, uh, a couple of years where we were just validating the market, building this new product, 
getting an MVP together or minimum viable product so that we could get it out to people and actually get it used in different landscapes and, and learn really rapidly and just keep advancing it. And, and so that sort of was where the actual, you know, wildlife drones came from at that point where we, we went, we participated in an innovation event. And at the end there was a, a pitch and you could win $10,000 at the end of that. And, and so we, we participated in that just to get the skills needed for a startup, but then we ended up winning and, and so oh, wow. Like, oh, wow. oh my gosh, we've got money. Okay. <laughs> And so, um, you know, we had that, that little bit of a boost and that's when we're like, we actually needed, we needed to set up a bank account and, and uh, like put that money somewhere because there were, you know, there were a, a few of us working together. And so, yeah, that's kind of where it began. And once we had some, some people who were um, early adopters of that technology, that was incredibly helpful for us. And uh, we were then able to go out and um, talk to investors. And we knew we kind of hit up, we hit the, the ceiling of the capability of some of the team at the time. And we, we needed to get new skills in, but we needed the money to, to pay for people's time to contribute. We couldn't just continue to well, expect everyone to work for free. So um, that getting those early adopters enabled us to then also secure some investment and that money then enabled us to build up the team from there. So yeah, it's kind of went from, bird watching to to owning a tech business it wasn't really my plan but you know here we are next we met ramon casares the visionary behind the ex situ rescued wildlife fine art photography gallery so let's actually talk about some of the solutions and what you've done so you've taken something very dark and made it beautiful in your you. wonderful gallery called Exitu. So <laughs> let's talk about that for a while. How did the idea of this gallery come to you? Where where did it begin? Exitu is actually a project that was born. I would like to, I would love to have like this amazing story about how it was, how it came to be, but it was born because of my love for studio photography and for wildlife, okay? So uh, somehow I wanted to do studio photography of wildlife, but as I told you, when I was a zookeeper, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I'm against captivity with no purpose, okay? That's my main issue. I'm against wildlife captivity with no purpose. So I thought, okay, how can I photograph wildlife in a studio? I can do rescued wildlife. And I, what I can do is tell their stories. So it kind of started there. And the, the good thing about that is that, it, as I told you, each of these animals in my photographs have a rescue story, has a, a represent a conservational issue. And they have a purpose. Their captivity has a purpose. Okay, being for because they cannot be released back into the wild, so they are part of a breeding program, or they are ambassadors for the rescue center that save them. They have a lot of reasons why they need to be captive, held captive. So that's what I like. I, that doesn't, at least to me, it doesn't contradicts my mission with Exidu. So yeah, that's how it came to be because I wanted to do wildlife in studio and show animals from a different perspective. What I do with Exidu is I work with, with a plain backdrop, black backdrop, sometimes white, but pretty much the idea with that is to show in the photo what you when you look at it, you only see the animal, right? So it's the only source of light, color, and life. And as they are really isolated in this black backdrop, they are clearly ex situ, which means out of environment. So the idea with ex situ, once I started working and working and taking more and more photos, I realized that conservation has this, uh, how to say, it, this communication problem, because they, for me at least, they keep talking to people that are already into that. You can see Discovery Channel, you can see Animal Planet, you can see Nat Geo, you can see a lot of these humongously big companies. And it's really hard for them, in my opinion, to reach 
a new target of people that aren't already into conservation or into wildlife. So what I was what I am trying to do with Exidu is play, uh, reach art galleries, art fairs, um, art magazines, whatever, private collections, stuff like that, and get these photographs, each of each of them with the rescue story of that animal, into a different uh, environment. The art environment is a, it's incredibly big. It's incredibly uh, filled with a lot of powerful people, uh, rich people, and I think it could make a difference once you are inside that little environment. You, it's not easy to get into that, but you are at, at least I'm trying to reach a new target of people because if we keep talking to ourselves about conservation, we are going to reach nowhere. We are not going to get nowhere. I mean, it's just, okay, uh, I think we should take care of the rainforest. Okay, yes, that's it. That's what conservation is doing right now. They are talking to themselves. So I think we need to find ways to bring the, the subject into a lot of more tables, so to speak, you know? Uh, and what I'm trying to do, uh, as what I do is photography is, okay, how can I add value to what I do and to conservation from a different perspective, reaching a new target of people, because, the, and this is my equation. Uh, let me see if I can make it clear. You have two kinds of people be outside of conservation. You have two kinds of people, people that don't care and people that don't know. The people that don't care are kind of lost. <laughs> but the people that don't know, you can inform them. And then they divide, you get them, you can divide them again into the, okay, they can be informed and not care or be informed and care. So when I'm aiming at that little target of, little target of people to inform them and to reach them from an absolutely new perspective and, and giving them the chance to be informed and see what road they decide to take. Because at the end of the day, when we all die, we will leave something behind. We will leave a legacy behind and it will end up showing if we took care of our environment or not. Each of us individually. So I'm trying to, through what I do, uh, at least give people the opportunity to care or know at least and be conscious of the fact that they knew what was happening and just looked the other way. Hmm. And when did you have this idea? When when did you launch this? I started working with Exidu already 10 years ago. Wow. So it's a long time. It's a long time. 10 years ago, I did the first photograph of a rescued pelican who got blinded in one eye because of a fishing line. And and when I saw the, the my first photographs of, of you know, studio portraits of animals and, and I was like, okay, this is really nice. I mean, this doesn't look like the typical wildlife picture of encyclopedia photo of an animal. This, this kind of, I managed to get a very different feeling to them. So then I started, okay, I need to use this to, to get to a new, to a new target of people. So that's, that's how it started. I mean, I just saw the, the aesthetic, the aesthetic that my work had and I'm I'm kind of Baroque and tenebrist. I like these these harsh harsh shadows in my work. So it, it, it really like the work itself took me to what I'm trying to do now, you know? I mean I was aiming to be in conservation in magazine and then I, 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 I it came to me that uh, that wasn't the path that I needed to take. And then that's when I started, you know, aiming at art galleries, fairs, and stuff like that. And it, it's been working pretty great so far. I mean, I have really a large spectrum of, of large media covering what I do, like newspapers, magazine, uh, TV channels, and stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of, you know, the snowball is, grow, is growing. So it takes a lot of time and hard work, but it's it's happening. So I'm... I'm and this is, for me, this is a life project. It's not going to have an end. So I have all the time in the war, hopefully. 
<laughs> and lastly, in August, we traveled back in time and met up with Pedro Frue, PhD, the leading researcher studying the La Hills bottlenose dolphin in Brazil. That's the perfect segue. Um, so it sounds like then they're coming probably in a lot of conflict with humans then if they're constantly on the coast. So in your research and your colleagues' research, what have you found have been some of the biggest threats to these dolphins? Well, there are several threats for dolphins that are living on the very close to the humans. Uh, so we are, as a human beings, we, of course, we, we need to develop, we need to do some uh, construction uh, industries and people need to fish. And all these um, have some kind of threat for, for these coastal animals, pollution as well. But today, I would say that the most uh, acute threat that we have is the bycatch on the, um, on the gillnets uh, mm. and, and on the artisanal gillnets, I would say. And um, some dolphins die uh, every year from being captured and on, this, on the gillnets. The numbers are not huge because the population are not huge. The population is very, very small. Talking, just thinking about the whole subspecies, we estimate it's it's half, but it's the estimate that you have today. It's it's rough, but the numbers are less than six hundred animals alive. Wow, that's insane. Yes, and. Um, here in Casino Beach, where I am based on, we have that's it's part of the Pats Lagoon. We have the Pats Lagoon estuary, that's the world's chocolate lagoon, and uh, and the coastal areas. We have the largest population of La Hills bottlenose dolphins. It's some it's a resident population that use the the estuary on a daily basis, and we have another coastal population that are just going that do not use the estuarine waters, stay on the coastal area, and they are different, uh, different populations in, in terms of uh, the, the animals that compose each one of these units. And you have, uh, considering the estuarine population of La Hills Baranas Dolphins in the coastal one here, we have about 100, 120 animals. And this is the largest population for the whole subspecies. We have maybe two um a record a record of uh, six animals being captured every year this is Ooh. the minimum estimate and this the number sounds very oh but it's not a large number but the the problem is that the population so is very very small and having two captures in fishing nets every year removing the animals from the population as these uh, the, as the lahios bottlenose dolphins are Almost all cetaceans are very slow growing and uh, slow reproducing. They don't have the, um, the capacity to replant, to, to, to re how do you say this? Replenish uh, or replace. To replenish, yeah. to replenish yeah. or, re or replace this, uh, the, the numbers that are being by mm. So we face a very acute threat that potentially is, is affecting the population to decline in a medium term. And for sure, if, this, if the fisheries change the area or change the, um, change the effort, this can be very, the, the, the numbers can be uh, much um, higher than, than six animals. So the f fisheries, they are very, very dynamics, you know, and this is something that, that uh, we should uh, be monitoring in close detail to detect any change in fisheries and in numbers of dolphins being, being, uh, being caught and how this is affecting the population dynamics as well. So mm. this is why we are, we are monitoring these animals since 1974. That is the first uh, effort that we have for, for the research with this population. And that is it, a snapshot of August wide-ranging all over the world episodes. If you have a question about any of these episodes, please submit it in the Rewildologist Facebook group or leave your comment on the YouTube version of this episode. 
As always, I want to thank you for being a part of the Rewildology community. If you'd like to support the show, some zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at rewildology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. Lastly, I'd like to thank Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear I use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.